everyone, my name is Srinidhi. And my name is George. We are master's students in Electrical Engineering in Columbia University following the Integrated Circuits and Systems track. We'll talk about the Digital Crop Project from VLSI Design Lab taught by Professor Peter Kinget in the Spring 2016 term. This is the block diagram of our chip. All the components within the dotted line box are on chip. From the crystal off chip, the X in and X out signals are fed into the oscillator circuit within the chip. The oscillator circuit produces a square waveform of 32.768 kHz, which is exactly 2 to the power 15. This is fed to a chain of 15 2 dividers which gives a 1 Hz output. This 1 Hz signal is then fed to a seconds counter, minutes counter and hours counter sequentially. For instance, the seconds counter has two parts, a modulo 10 counter for the 1's digit of the seconds and a modulo 6 counter for the 10's digit of the seconds. From each of these counters, we get a BCD encoded 4 bits. These muxes are then, these two muxes are then used to select between setting mode and normal operation. The setting mode signal is given through the advanced minutes and the advanced hours pins. Next, this block here is a multiplexed display driver, which is essentially a modulo 6 counter with an 8 kHz input tapped after the second stage of the frequency divider circuit here. Based on the enable signals from this driver, one of the six BCD encoded 4 bits is selected through a 6, is to, one, six to 1 MUX. There are four of these 6 to 1 MUXs for each bit of the BCD output from the counters. There is a 7 segment decoder which gives the A to G outputs used for the digit LED based on the BCD input. There is also a 3 to 6 decoder which is used to give one hot enable signals to switch the corresponding LED digit on in the PCB. For the schematic and layout design, we used IBM 8RF 130 nanometer CMOS technology. Using Cadence Virtuoso, we started from a transistor level and built the basic components. Here you can see our chip's top level schematic. The logical gates we used to create all our blocks are an inverter, an AND2 gate, and a transmission gate. These blocks form our finite bases, and we have standard cell dimensions for all of them. Next, we show the D flip flop created from our finite bases. We use the dynamic implementation. As you can see in the D flip-flop layout, standard cell size of the finite basis renders our layout more compact. An important block of our chip is a counter. Here we show the schematic of a 0 to 9 counter. It requires 4 bits, so we assign 4 flip-flops to it. This is the layout of the counter, as well as the layout of the frequency divider. Finally, our final layout is shown. ESD protection was added and tape out was done according to Moses' rules. We designed the PCB using Diptrace software. This is our PCB schematic. Initially, we selected the components for the PCB. Some of them were available in Diptrace libraries, and for the rest, we designed our own components. The most challenging step in our design was to provide minimum 1.8 volt to the LED displays when the chip is powered with 1.2 volts. This was solved by using these level shifters and these two LDOs to give 1.2 volt and 1.8 volt supplies. Next, the schematic was verified and the components were placed. After completing the routing for the layout, we added copper pores for the ground and the VDD in the bottom and top layers respectively. 
Finally, after verifying the layout against the schematic, we exported the Gerber files and NC drill file. 3D exportation was also done to view the complete PCB design. First, we tested the chip on a breadboard. Using a power source and a frequency generator, we probed the output pins to an oscilloscope. Significant features are the 1 Hz frequency on the test pin, the enable signals and the 7 segment displays. After verifying the chip's operation, we started testing the PCB. It is imperative that the PCB must be tested first without the chip mounted on it. We measured the power circuitry nodes to verify that we have the proper voltage and current values. Next, we conducted a connectivity check to the rest of the components, and especially the LED display circuitry. After testing the crystal oscillator ports as well, we mounted the chip on the PCB and started testing the whole design. The digital clock operation is now verified. So this is our PCB. There are two different power sources. You can give power it up with the battery or with the USB. Let's try the USB first. When you power up with the USB, you see that the clock is functioning. This is the power select switch which chooses between the battery or the USB. Now we'll switch to the battery operation. When connecting the battery, you see that the, the clock is still running. This is three D different LDOs which gives the required voltages. The first LDO gives 5 volts. Which is then later converted to 1.2 to power up the chip. And then the same 5 volts is converted to 1.8 as well to power up the LEDs. There is a test pin which gives 1 Hz signal. We will show you the test pin right now. As you see over here, there is a square wave with a time period of 1 second and amplitude of 1.2 volts. Now, if you press the global reset, you see that the time resets back and starts from the first second onwards. Now illustrate the setting mode of a digital clock. Minutes. Now time is around 2.05. So now we look into the clock input methods for the chip. The PCB is designed to have three different clock sources. One clock source is the crystal. The chip, the PCB right now is powered through this crystal. External sources are two different types. One is an external oscillator, otherwise you can have it through an external function generator as well. This switch over here chooses between the crystal or an external source. This switch over here, the oscillator or generator switch, chooses between among the two external sources, a crystal oscillator or a function generator. IC design is an iterative process, meaning you often have to backtrack to earlier steps to alter your assumptions and adjust your design. Thus, a more refined parallel approach is always better than a serial one. Also, when designing a component, it is imperative that it is functioning not just standalone, but interconnected with all the components of the chip. Another important fact is that a correct simulation in the lab using CAD tools does not guarantee that the chip you are designing will function properly. You need to be looking into more intricate details before proceeding to the tape out of the chip. In VLSI Design Lab, you experience the complete process of integrated circuit design. Students are exposed to all stages of chip design, PCB design, and testing. You get actual hands-on experience to an end-to-end -end design of a product. IC design leaves no room for mistakes. Instead, you need to have a very meticulous design methodology that exhaustively checks in simulation if the design will work after fabrication. Professor Kinget states that as an IC designer, you need to have a healthy paranoia about making mistakes or sloppy work. 
details do matter and they do decide the final result. Thus, attention to detail is absolutely necessary. At this point, we would like to thank our professor Peter Kinge for the VLSI Design Lab course, Moses for its educational program of chip fabrication, and our teaching assistants Vivek Mangal and Yang Su for their guidance and advice. For more details about our work, you can visit our project's webpage, and if you have any questions, feel free to contact us. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thank you.